afternoon. This is Celia Lacayo uh, with LA Social Science, Associate Director of Community Engagement, and also a professor in Chicana, Chicano, Central American Studies, and African American Studies. Uh, today, um, continuing our amazing uh, social science book series of our experts, uh, we have for you a book on the coronavirus. Yes, uh, this is hot off the press, and I know a lot of folk are going to want to really uh, listen um, and, and hear how they can get a hold of this book, um, which has a, a, an amazing and global perspective. So with us today is Vinay Lau, and he is he, um, here at UCLA, Professor of History and Asian American Studies. Um, and the book is titled, The Fury of COVID-19, The Politics, Histories, and Unrequited Love of the Coronavirus. Um, hello, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you very much. Wonderful, well let's get underway. Uh, so tell us, what, what is the singular point you aim to get across in this book? Well, um, I, I don't know if I could really speak of a singular point, but uh, let, let's put it this way, that uh, what I want to try to suggest in the book, uh, and I think that this is conveyed in what some people have seen as the enig enigmatic part of the title, the last part of the subtitle, that I think the coronavirus is trying to, this pandemic is trying to convey a message to us, if I may put it this way. Now, I, I know that that's not the way that most people would prefer to see it because obviously uh, the pandemic has inflicted a huge amount of suffering. The entire world is in turmoil. Uh, and to think that, to think that uh, there may be a message of unrequited love would be uh, to some people, a stretch of the imagination. But I, I think that, you know, we have to be not just scholarly in our investigation, but we have to be creative and imaginative. And we're living at a time uh, uh, when uh, th there are some fundamental problems that we have not adequately addressed and nothing more fundamental to the future of humanity than the question of climate change. So even though the pandemic at this point may seem to be the most pressing issue in the long run, the most pressing issue unquestionably is the question of climate change. And I think it has to be admitted and has to be said that there's still a large number of people in this country, uh, in the United States particularly, who actually don't think that climate change is an issue. Uh, and we have to begin with the person who is the incumbent in the White House, the, the sitting president, who is a climate change denier, right? So, so and, and you might, of course, ask, what is the relationship of the coronavirus pandemic to climate change? But one of the things that happened, and this is, again, something that is really quite extraordinary about the coronavirus pandemic, is that we have never in history witnessed this level of state intervention. That is also what is singular about the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, there have been instances, I mean, World War II would be one good instance where the United States, for example, Germany, France, all the major players marshaled all the resources of the state to try to win the war. But, but the level of state intervention I'm speaking of is of a magnitude today that we cannot comprehend. Nothing in history has prepared us for this. And we're not speaking about state intervention only in 10 or 20 or 30 countries. We're speaking about state intervention in every country of the world. And partly as a consequence of this state intervention, one of the things that happened, of course, is that the, the economies of every country just completely shut down, in a manner of speaking, for months. Now, when the economy shut, shuts down, levels of consumption go down. The, the, you know, the, it, not only levels of consumption go down, but you obviously see the implications of climate change. I mean, everywhere in the world, the air just became clean, right? I mean, in India, the change was phenomenal. And I mentioned India not because I come from India and because I'm invested in India as much as I am in the United States, but because India is notorious for its pollution levels. I mean, 16 of the 20 most polluted countries in the world are in India. Uh, and, and within a month or two, the change in India was phenomenal, right? I mean, entirely unexpected. So if we're thinking about the coronavirus and its singularity, one is certainly that it helps us think about climate change in a way that nothing else has. And secondly, it is something that has in fact 
uh, introduced us to the idea of state intervention at a level which was previously incomprehensible. And thirdly, and I will stop with that with respect to the question of the singularity of the coronavirus pandemic. Thirdly, you know, be partly in consequence of the kinds of communication networks we have, uh, digital media, communication satellites, television, the coronavirus pandemic really has, in a sense, brought us to an awareness of the idea of a universal humanity. And I don't mean this in some pedestrian fashion that we are all in it together. Well, yes, we are and we are not. We know that some people have suffered a lot more than others. There are inequalities which have determined the outcomes in many countries. But the fact is that all over the world, everyone is awaiting news of a vaccine, for example, right? right? So everywhere people have pinned their hopes on something called science. Um, and whether science will be sufficient to help us get through this is, I think, actually a question that we really need to think about quite seriously. And my book is intended to help us do that as well. Thank you. Um, that is definitely one of the things that struck me about one of the many contributions of your book is this message around this um, universal humanity, uh, climate change, and the role of the state. Um, and I wanted to, uh, again, one of the contributions is you didn't solely uh, look at one region, one country, very much a global perspective, uh, as the pandemic has uh, been a, a global experience. So tell us how the histories of different countries uh, reflected their response to the coronavirus and their values in general. Right. So this, this is a this is a very interesting question and, and a, a complex question. I mean, it's something that I've sought to address uh, uh, in my book at some length by looking, for example, at the United States, uh, Sweden, uh, uh, Great Britain, uh, Cuba, Vietnam, India, uh, China. Right. So and, and it won't be possible, obviously, to address how each of these countries um, has dealt with it. That's something I do more in the book. Uh, but just to give uh, just to give everyone uh, something of an idea about what is really uh, um, at stake in this and and how we might think about whether the uh, the uh, national history uh, of a country as it were uh, the disposition of its people whether all of that has had any consequences in how countries have thought about addressing the pandemic that is a question that I have sought to address in the book and to which I will speak now. So let, let's take a few illustrations very quickly. Now, uh, we, uh, you know, it's called COVID-19 because it was literally, literally December 31st when, uh, you, you know, the information about this, as it were, uh, first became available, not really to the West, but this is when it's supposed to have broken out. And here, I'm not interested in whether it broke out much earlier, as has now been suspected, and certainly a couple of months before that. Uh, but but uh, the key thing here is that within a few weeks of this, uh, of the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, that is to say, before the end of January, let's begin with the reaction in Vietnam. Vietnam had already imposed a lockdown. All right, now, and Vietnam's case is, is, is particularly interesting because we are not speaking about a very small country such as New Zealand with, you know, a few million people. I mean, Vietnam has a population of 100 million. All right, so it's, it's population-wise a very large country. It's also a communist state. Um, and I think we need to look at countries with different political systems, uh, different from the United States, uh, in order to understand some of the complexities. Um, uh, Vietnam did what the United States did. I mean, one of the few things that Trump did, that President Trump did, was that he banned flights from China, but he did not ban flights from Macau or Hong Kong or Taiwan. Um, and we know that one of the consequences of that was that people from the mainland actually went to Hong Kong and Macau and they, and they took flights from there. And so there were actually tens of thousands of people who came uh, to the United States from the PRC to other places. Where, what Vietnam did was it shut down all flights coming from that part of the world. Um, uh, and if you look at uh, 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 Vietnam today, there have been fewer than 35 deaths with a population of 100 million in comparison to almost 
a quarter of a million deaths in the United States, which has, you know, roughly three times as many people, a little bit more than three times, 330, 340 million, right? I mean, so the difference is astronomical. Um, uh, and many people think that this is simply because of the fact that Vietnam is a communist state, so, you know, an authoritarian political system, much as in China, you can, you can lay down rules and regulations which everyone is commanded to follow. But the fact of the matter is that the other uh, countries in that region were also singularly successful um, in not just mitigating the virus, but in really containing it. And here, I think the examples one would have to take would, be, would include Taiwan and South Korea, uh, both of which have been su spectacularly successful. Now, one reason for that uh, and, their, and, the, and their political systems cannot be viewed as identical to the political systems, um, uh, political system of Vietnam. Uh, I don't think we can call South Korea a, a, a communist state by any stretch of the imagination. All right. Uh, but, but it is important to remember uh, that, that all of this uh, region still had a historical memory of SARS, of what happened in 2002. So they had in place a number of protocols which they followed very rigorously, um, including con contact tracing, uh, education. I mean, I just had a friend who went back to Taiwan and he told me that when he arrived there, uh, you know, he was taken to uh, uh, his home, which is over 100 miles away, uh, in, in a car which was supplied by the state. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, and he and his uh, spouse uh, then stay in their own home, which is... Uh, uh, over 100 miles from the airport, from Taipei. Uh, they, they have groceries brought to them. They get calls three times a day. Uh, it, it, every movement of theirs is monitored. But that entire region has not had a single case, a single new case in the last couple of months. And you contrast that to the United States, which yesterday registered almost 160,000 new cases, right? Now you think, all right, so what does that tell us about the United States? Now, of course, I mean, I think we have to appreciate that the fact that the United States is a country uh, where there is a tradition of profound suspicion of the state on part of many people. And I think that some suspicion of the state is desirable. In fact, it's healthy. But here the problem uh, is not simply a matter of the fact that there is a that that there is no central regulatory authority which has determined what the what the guidelines should be. I think that in an instance of this kind, we need that. We very much need that. But it also has to do with with the breakdown of the social order in this country. It has to do it has to do with the fact that this country has not invested in public health infrastructure. It has left a large number of people, particularly people who are at the margins, whether because of uh, the color of their skin uh, uh, or uh, on account of other factors, uh, that in the United States, what we're seeing is we're seeing a number of things coming together, some of them which have a long history, such as these traits of individualism that I was adverting to just a moment ago, but some of which also have to do with the fact that the state here has become almost entirely dysfunctional in the United States, all right? And then we can take as a contrast, so on the one hand, we have Vietnam, we have the United States, we can take as a contrast Great Britain, again, a long history there because, you know, initially what Britain sought to do was to actually try to achieve herd immunity, uh, and then they realized the folly of that, particularly at that stage. Uh, but it's it's really quite amazing that the British uh, Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who himself uh, became ill with the coronavirus, as did Trump much later on, that, that one of the things he said was that, you know, look, we can't impose these regulations because they will impinge on the inalienable right of the English to go to the pub and have their drink. Now, you know, you might, you might chuckle at that, but, but what he's really speaking about is certain, certain traits of Englishness, this idea that we are a people of liberty, right? We are a people who prize our liberty, who prize our eccentricities, and we must be permitted them. And, and of course, my response to that is that, well, yes, you must be permitted them. But now what we are speaking about is we are speaking about a situation which is a situation of grave international health emergency, 
right? And so perhaps we have to think about how we retain some of these liberties while at the same time we think about the common good, right? And I think that one way of distinguishing the responses of the countries, I mean, I could complicate this picture enormously by looking at France and Sweden and Cuba, countries which I do look at in my book, but here I'm suggesting that one way to think about it is to also think about how one must position the idea of individual autonomy and liberty against some notion of the common good. And I think countries which have thought about the common good have done much better in this pandemic than those countries that have not thought of it. You know, So that, that would be a brief uh, articulation of uh, the responses of different countries and how the histories of those countries and the values of those people may have actually shaped the responses, you know. Absolutely. I can definitely attest from reading the book that one of the major contributions is that conversation between uh, states and uh, like Great Britain and the U.S. and the rhetoric of liberty versus other uh, countries, as you mentioned, uh, who did much better, do are doing better because of the common good and collective. Um, can you you can you also tell us you know continuing this comparison and bringing it back to the U.S. What do comments like "quote unquote" uh, the China virus from Trump uh, from Trump and others alike impact international cooperation? So I, I think that uh, we can view this in a number of different dimensions. I'm going to confine myself here to two dimensions of it. All right. So one is that. I, uh, that, so let's begin with this. Let's begin with the fact that there is actually in place a, a, uh, a mandate from the WHO, from the World Health Organization. This goes back a number of decades. Uh, and this mandate effectively is that one cannot designate uh, a virus, uh, for example, uh, or an epidemic by the, um, the name of the place from where it is supposed to have originated. Uh, it's a, there, there, is a, there is a stipulation, international stipulation, that one shouldn't do that. Um, um, and, and, you know, and there is a long history uh, of uh, countries being, of a particular epidemic or pandemic or a virus, some kind of outbreak being associated with a place. So, for example, the 1918-20 uh, influenza epidemic uh, which was on an astronomical scale. I mean, now the revised estimates are that the 1918 um, influenza epidemic, which went on for a number of years, a couple of years at least, uh, 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 killed between 50 to 100 million people. And then we have to remember that the population of the world at that time was much smaller than it is now. So proportionately, we're speaking about an enormous mortality. Uh, but this uh, influenza epidemic is nicknamed the Spanish flu. Uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, the Spanish are not very happy about it uh, at all. In fact, it had nothing to do with Spain. The most likely or place of origin of this actually, according to the most recent research, is Kansas in the United States. Uh, that's the most likely origin of this, um, uh, of, this epi uh, of this influenza epidemic. But it was nicknamed the Spanish flu because uh, 1918, the uh, the First World War what was going on, um, and and the and uh, you, you know just as just as is the case today, countries were using uh, the influenza epidemic as propaganda. You know, saying it originated in such and such place. The the only country in Europe, really, uh, or one of the few countries in Europe that was not involved in the war, which was neutral, was Spain. So the most reliable news was coming from Spain. Uh, and this is how it got to be nicknamed the Spanish flu. All right. Now, going back to the question about, about Trump and other Republicans calling it the China virus. Uh, so I've already indicated that this is undesirable, simply, simply speaking about it in a political and legal fashion. But I think one needs to look at the ethical dimension of it. And the ethical dimension is that, of course, what it does is it, it, it's a form of scapegoating. And we know that epidemics have always been associated historically with scapegoating, all right? I mean, uh, during the Black Death, the Jews were scapegoated, among many others. Uh, there were other groups of people who were scapegoated as well. 
Um, uh, and in this case, it's the scapegoating of uh, the Chinese. Um, uh, in India, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a part of India, Northeast India, where the people have more uh, what are called Mongoloid features. So they might look, quote, more Chinese to the, to the average Indian. Uh, and some of these people uh, uh, have been abused and discriminated against in recent months on account of um, uh, uh, this virus being associated with China. And I, and I don't think, incidentally, that it's only in the U.S. that there's been a predisposition to call it the China virus. I, I think it's greater here uh, for a number of reasons, but certainly in India, there have been some parts of the Indian middle class that have actually associated with, uh, with, with China. But in the United States, it has led to an enormous increase of uh, 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 hate crimes uh, and racially motivated attacks against Chinese Americans and more broadly Asian Americans, right? So its consequences in that sense have been wholly undesirable. Now, there is another dimension of it. I'm going to speak to that very, very briefly, and that is simply this, that we will have to think about new forms of medical internationalism today in consequence of the coronavirus. Right? So at the moment, the principal organization we have in the world to, to help us get through epidemics uh, and pandemics, um, uh, even uh, you know, diseases such as cholera, uh, measles, um, and other like diseases, the, the only organization we really have on an international scale is the WHO, the World Health Organization. But I think the WHO was created in the aftermath of World War II to deal with a different class of diseases. It was singularly successful. Uh, and I think that's the most successful campaign that the WHO has ever conducted internationally. And I think every country collaborated in it is the campaign for the eradication of smallpox, which was successful. Uh, the other one is polio, which has nearly, which has almost universally been eradicated. There's still a few hundred cases uh, in a few countries, uh, but by and large, polio has been eradicated. All right. But it was not, the WHO was not created to deal, as it were, with this new kind of pathogen that we have. All right. Uh, these pathogens have, that parasites uh, uh, that have escaped from uh, res reservoirs of nature because of the encroachment of human beings um, uh, and which uh, are largely zoonotic diseases, right? These are largely zoonotic diseases. I don't think the WHO has been, is being equipped traditionally to deal with it. And, and unfortunately, it is being really severely undermined, not just by the United States, but even by China, which I think it must be said, did try to obfuscate what happened this time, just as it tried to obfuscate what happened uh, with SARS in 2002. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a record of that. We know exactly what China did and didn't do in 2002 uh, as well. But on the other hand, I think it would be impossible to, put, uh, to blame uh, the WHO because once countries were warned, many countries did address the issue. The United States didn't. That's the singular fact, right? So, so I think when we call it the China virus, apart from that, apart from its implications for groups of people, for individuals, uh, the rise of xenophobia throughout the world, uh, the fact that it it that it actually uh, almost motivates people to to indulge in r racially motivated attacks and hate crimes. Uh, uh, with impunity. Apart from all of that, there is a question of, of whether it actually undermines critical forms of cooperation that are required today. Wonderful. So as you can see, this book offers many, many rich contributions and different uh, types of discussions around coronavirus from legal to moral to ethical and these comparative analysis between groups and the need for collective action um, to really uh, be able to challenge the uh, pandemic. I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, again, this is Celia Lacayo with UCLA LA Social Science, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.